Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insights. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. Chinese State Councilor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi joined his counterparts from Russia and India for a virtual online conference today. The Russian India China meeting, the group also known as RIC, RIC, was convened at the initiative of Moscow and largely focused on cooperation to take on the COVID 19 pandemic. Financial stability, global security, and border issues also on top of the agenda. How could China and India deal with the serious clashes between their troops at the Galwan Valley? And how has China's tie with Russia and India grown over the decades? What is likely to be from now on? We have invited guests from the three countries for an in-depth discussion about the pandemic and certainly about the geopolitical issues. And now in Beijing, we are joined by Rong Ying, Vice President of a CIIS, China Institute of International Studies. In New Delhi, India, we have Professor Swaran Singh of the School of International Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University. And in Moscow, Russia, we are joined by Mark Sloboda, International Relations and Security Analyst. Welcome as well. Well, let's focus on the real topic for the trilateral meeting, at least on the record, that is to deal with the pandemic. Now, we have three nations at very different stages of facing COVID-19. China battling successfully during the first stage, but recently also seen some spikes, which have scared a lot of Chinese. Now contained, but who knows what's to come next. Russia and India, unfortunately, are both on the top five in terms of daily outbreak numbers. We keep our fingers crossed for the people in the two countries. Certainly, all are very active, are trying to look for solutions, and economies suffering. At this point, Mr. Sloboda, what do you think can be the follow-up of concrete results of this meeting among the three foreign ministers? You know, if um, Russia, for instance, which is uh, still uh, has quite serious infection rate numbers, uh, is in need of uh, materials in, uh, in, ter uh, in terms of uh, personal protective equipment, ventilators, uh, and so on, I think uh, uh, China will probably be the first uh, to provide an opportunity uh, to uh, deliver uh, such aid as needed. Uh, I, I would expect that they would extend that offer to uh, India as well. Um, but uh, more than that, I think they're going to be discussing the eventual reopening of uh, the borders, uh, when that will take place, um, and, and uh, you know, the, the phases, because I'm sure it will not be a, an immediate uh, uh, hmm. event. There will be a, a phase mechanisms involved, and so they will be probably that will be I think one of the major topics of discussion is not only where in the crisis they are, but how we eventually come out of it. Mm. Mr. Rong, uh, you were in Beijing during the recent uh, spike, though at this point only more than 200 people being confirmed. That's a small number compared to the others, but it scared a lot of people. And Mr. Rong, the unpredictability of the nature of this virus and the fact that the global landscape of how the virus has been spreading is still uh, speeding up as we speak. What would that mean for China to work with different partners, certainly Russia and India included as the BRICS nations? Indeed, I think the uh at least at the, the, uh, the very concrete level, I think China, India, Russia bilaterally we have already have a very close sort of cooperation in terms of sharing uh, experiences, mm. managing the uh, uh, challenges of, uh, on the one hand, you have to um, deal with the uh, handle the pandemic. On the other, you have to also look at the uh, the need to open up and and uh, as you said exactly i think the uh, current uh, spike of the cases in beijing even though i think now is more or less under control 
uh, gives an added value and the, the lessons mm. and experience of China, Beijing and China in general added value for that. And the other thing that I believe that in the process of managing or handling of this uh, the pandemic of COVID-19, China has put forward quite a lot of initiatives and for I mean improving the uh, uh, managing and improving the uh, challenges like the global uh, health sort of uh, threat. This is I think has always been uh, one of the primary sort of tasks or go, uh, 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 issues right. facing the trilateral. And I think China would like uh, the work with these two countries and in, and come up with a united or converted voice in mm. how to do that. And then in this context, I think the impact of the uh, uh, of the co uh, the co uh, pandemic uh, 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 on the uh, uh, international sort of a situation mm. in general, uh, will, which means that how to manage promote further the uh, multilateralism, how to promote mm. uh, further, I mean, deal with challenges uh, without politicizing, without, I think, uh, 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 dividing the, the world uh, mm. as, uh, uh, along the ideological level. Mm. Uh, Mr. Singh, Professor Singh, I got to learn a little bit about the pandemic situation in India before coming into the studio. Now, the capital city, for example, New Delhi, we have seen steady rise, but nothing like dramatic. Yet in three specific states of India, the number are increasing dramatically. So that's the, the nature of challenge that you are facing right now in India about COVID-19. With that, what do you have in mind in terms of cooperation possibilities with the other two countries from India's perspective? Just a footnote. I interviewed the Indian ambassador to China uh, several months ago uh, when Beijing's uh, or China's overall pandemic situation calmed down. I saw how hard he has been working with his Chinese counterparts to help people of both sides. So tell me more about what kind of cooperative ideas India has now in terms of fighting against COVID-19 right now complex situation. You gave an excellent example yourself as to how both our diplomats and our leaders in Russia, China and India have addressed this as a problem for humanity. It's not a problem for nation states, it's a problem of humanity and we must all come together. And as you said, they saw at initial stages India providing some help to China and now China is providing some help to India and to, in fact, 100 plus countries indeed. China had an advantage of coming out of COVID-19, unless we see some cases now which are being described as second wave, but China had been out and helping 100 plus nations. Second very quick point is Russia, China, India have come together in various groupings recently, last two decades, primarily as emerging economies. And if the pandemic is having a hit on economy. Mm. These three nations have already learned how to work together and evolve strategies to address those problems. So I think this is going to also be both a challenge and an opportunity now to reinforce that relationship that Russia, China and India have built over years. Uh, there were some earlier opening up, but then uh things have changed and Russia has to once again face uh, more closing down. So what is the current stage and how do you expect the other parties uh, to be able to work together on multilateral platforms? I had to put a, a little bit of um, a rain shower on all the talk of, of multilateralism. You have to note that when we are faced with a pandemic crisis, the first thing we do is actually retreat to within our national borders. Exactly. Uh, and it, it is a kind of a, a realist way of dealing with it, but it's also the tools we have lacking the world government. Um, Russia right now is, is not in a good place uh, with the virus. It's certainly not as bad as, say, the United States and the United Kingdom have been in dealing with it. Um, but uh, I, I think that the, Russia is, should not be ready to open its borders anytime soon. It still mm -hmm. has a high infection. 
unfortunately, despite the best efforts of the Russian government, shall we say that the Russian people lack the discipline that the Chinese citizen, citizenry showed um, in uh, uh, holding fast uh, to lockdowns uh, and social distancing. They were quite exemplary in that regard. I wish some of my fellow citizens uh, showed that discipline here. But there is really, uh, gentlemen, I have to say, a white elephant in the room that we really need to deal with. I mean, uh, we could talk about the multilateralism, which is important. We should talk about and certainly work on it, the common challenges of COVID-19. But there is a geopolitical threat between uh, China and India's relations. And it took the diplomats of almost the highest resort uh, to talk to one another. Mr. Rong, now, what's China going to do? Um, it's trying to prepare for all options. Meanwhile, Professor Singh, uh, now in India, I know certain kinds of nationalism has also been provoked. Uh, where is it driving the country to? Can the current administration be able to take hold of the, shall I say, the sentiment inside your country? So I go to Professor Singh maybe first, and then I go to Mr. Rong later. There are differences in the very political systems of uh, China and India. And that sometimes creates uh, misinterpretations on both sides. And the same is true of the border, where at least at dozen places in the so-called line of actual control, there are again confusions. The first confusion I'm talking about is I request my Chinese viewers and friends to understand the way India works. There are going to be all kinds of public debates and public views uh, in the media that you will hear. There is uh, enormous tension, uh, partly because, as I mentioned, there are confusion on both sides. And what has happened is that over the last few decades, Chinese have been able to build enormous amount of infrastructure on their side of line of actual control, and therefore can now bring forward larger number, heavier equipment very quickly. And India is also building infrastructure on Indian side. So the movement of troops closer to the line of actual control happens much faster. We are not used to it on both sides. And very often, this sudden surprise and counters, when they become far more intense and frequent, and leads to this raising of tempers, which means that the older mechanisms are not very helpful in dealing with these. And very quickly, I'll make a suggestion that we need to revise some of those mechanisms that, uh, that have so far helped us in peace and tranquility on the border, we could start with something like announcing to each other as to what is the patrol party going from point A to point B, so that the other party can respond in communication rather than suddenly soldiers meeting somewhere and getting angry with each other. Okay. So fundamentally, the mechanisms that have helped us ensure peace for the last 40 years have become dated now with the new capabilities on both sides we now need to revise our mechanisms so that we can sustain peace and tranquility and if possible perhaps start working in exchanging maps and in resolving that border so that we don't get into problems like this. Professor Singh, if I could remind you before I go to the Chinese guest uh, that this issue could well hijack the whole nature of malfaceted, uh, not easy to build over the decades after efforts of so many generations, this relationship between China and India. And uh, your response quickly about the not so long ago, both sides agreed upon a bottom line about how to look at the border and how to respect the fact that both sides should not provoke the other side. Uh, your final thoughts about this issue before I go to your Chinese counterpart. Mr. Singh, please. I'm sure Chinese have their point of view, India has our own point of view, but fundamentally there are confusions that occur in such areas. The fact that both sides are constantly talking right on the border at the level of core commanders, at the level of foreign ministers, mm. we might see a hand forum and defense ministers. I think that shows the maturity of relationship and India constantly has been talking of sustaining peace, ensuring peace, and I think that message as you heard from the Prime Minister, I think is important to also carry forward I see. and then understand how China is approaching this issue right now.
Okay, Mr. Rong, I need you to respond to your Indian counterpart. Uh, several points. First of all, what about the nature of the recent clash from the Chinese perspective? I understand China says it also has evidence that it was the other side that have uh, spoiled the latest uh, agreement, first of all. Secondly, I also well, want you mm -hmm. to help us understand whether the so-called revision of the current mechanism as mentioned by your Indian counterpart, Professor Singh, should also be in the thoughts from the Chinese side. Mr. Rong. I think the Chinese side has made very clear that we uh, while uh, insisting or persisting its position that what happened, uh, I mean, the Galavan Valley incident, I mean, we're talking about the June the uh, uh, 15th and 16th incident, the clashes happened in the, at the Chinese side of LAC. While if you look at the, China, the Indian's foreign ministry's uh, statement, they said that the, the Indian side of LAC. So that is the constitute the dispute. So my suggestion in responding uh, uh, to uh, Dr. Swanon Singh's uh, views and to help for the purpose of help our audience world or I mean audience outside China and India to understand is let us have uh, I mean real and objective sort of a, a, a review of, of of the nature of the the, the picture of, of the. China boundary, uh, India boundary question. So this is, I think, the most important thing. And otherwise, I think the Chinese foreign ministry, and I think I'm here, particularly the foreign uh, state councillors view that as in the wake of this incident, it urged the Indian side to conduct a thorough investigation about what happened will be helpful. If well, I could interpret what you just said, which is uh, Chinese side would urge the Indian side to do its own investigation about exactly what happened before the two sides could talk about other bigger issues such as the revision of the mechanism and some of the other suggestions that might be coming from New Delhi. Is that what you're trying to say? Yes, this is okay. the most important okay, sir. thing. The All second, right. second thing, of course, is that uh, we could look at the, re the, the, the other possibilities, or options uh, while in the wake of this investigation, uh, or, or if we can do it jointly, then we would come up with some ideas how we can improve the mechanisms mm. or, and how to ensure the, the protocols, the norms, the practice that has been proved effective in managing the conflict, I mean, uh, 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 the way that it would be. Uh, while in, instead of rush and jump into the conclusion, the mechanisms are not working, the protocols are bad, and uh, or even go as far as reviving unilaterally the so-called rule of engagement uh, 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 for the military, for the border troop. That is very much very okay. dangerous. And big problem. Okay, another, another question, if I could, uh, related to your uh, Indian counterpart's uh, comments is that uh, whether uh, you think there could be hijacking eventually of the two, rel two countries' relations, which really has been painstakingly being built by generations' efforts, uh, this time by a border issue. This is very much the danger and the risk. And this is exactly the reason, and I think uh, uh, as seen that both uh, Dr. Swalan Singh and I and other co uh, colleagues, both in China and India, are, uh, are calling upon. Mm. We need to draw the right lessons. We, we, we need to learn the right experiences from managing the boundary issues. And starting from the 1962 border conflict. Mr. Mr. Rong, mm -hmm. another question related to what you have just heard from your Indian counterpart. Will China be sophisticated enough, uh, uh, wondered uh, Professor Singh earlier, to identify what is the real official voice of India rather than the fights in the media among different factors going on in India for one reason or another? Certainly, I think both China and, uh, and the Chinese and the Indians are sophisticated and uh, people. So mm. certainly, we're, <laughs> I am very much sure that we are able to tell. The question or the problem, I think, for diplomats and also, I think, for the politicians and the leadership is that whether they will be able, whether able to manage the backlash, the pressure 
from the uh, uh, the public yeah. uh, uh, as a result of unbalanced or, or unobjective or emotional sort of uh, uh, presentation of the picture. That's why I think it's to, to set a straight, uh, a sort of set the record straight to have okay. a full objective picture of, of the nature of the incident and the boundary issues is very much important. Got it. So simply put pointing finger of the infiltration or uh, so the invasion is not good. That's why I think Prime Minister Modi's remarks, even though that received a lot of backlash, is important. He said it, that no chance sort of invasion or incursion, incursion from the Chinese side to the Indian territory. I think he's referring to the fact because okay. there's no agreement or demarcated border uh, around right. China and India. Okay, uh, Mr. Singh, uh, use your answer 30 seconds or so because you had your time. I just want you to quickly respond. Professor Singh, please. <laughs> I was saying both China and India sometimes have difficulty to understand the other side's narratives. Both sides have these limitations. Okay. We have to overcome these limitations. We have to really learn from each other and help each other to understand what is the real narrative and what is the way of, of building that narrative on both sides. Now, my job is to close it up with some kinds of reflection and possibly uh, prospects. Uh, that the three sides can work together. After all, there's a meeting taking place on Tuesday. There's also an important meeting taking place on Wednesday. So let me have every one of you, 15 seconds. You are all eloquent speakers, but 15 seconds only for every one of you. Help me to understand uh, what should be concretely worked on after Tuesday and Wednesday's meetings. Now, uh, let me have uh, Professor Singh go first from India. This is not the first time we have tensions on the border, though this time it was really bad, lost lives on Indian side, India has declared figures, but we also have had mechanisms that every time have ensured that consultations can ensure that both troops go back to status quo. Hmm. And we are seeing both the military leaders and of course our ministers are talking, both defense ministers and foreign ministers, I'm hopeful that they will find some way of ensuring that the troops go back to where they were in April this year. Okay. And then maybe other things can be brought to the table. Mr. Rong, your 15 seconds. Right, I think this is a big time for RIC, the, what we call Russia, India, and China. And this is a big time for the three countries to uh, come up as voice, common voice, to for the challenges for the difficult times that we are, we are, we are in. Okay. And it has always been the commonalities, the convergences, and the visions of RIC that makes this grouping uh, important. All right. Certainly a warm-up is needed, but cool-minded is also required, I guess, for that discussion. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Svaran Singh from India. Rong Ying from China. Thank you. Really appreciate it.